Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we're here with a panel on how international financing and co-productions and other ways that you can uh, minimize the risk to the investors that come in for various projects. Uh, I w want to introduce my guests. Um, we'll start w with Jake. I run three studios, one in Canada, one in Louisiana, and one in the UK, and a range of different companies that support the, the projects that we do. Um, so Black Iron Studios in the UK, and we just shot uh, Breaking the Bank there, and did Miracle on the Hudson before that. Um, and, and we also use it for third party projects. We have 24 starting shooting there next week, actually. Um, and in Louisiana, where we have very large tax incentive, um, we have a, a big, unique studio set across 15 acres um, with lots of antebellum buildings and beautiful southern backdrops. Um, and in Canada, up north, where we've again got a very uh, aggressive incentive, um, got very good deep crews and, and good infrastructure. I certainly must say that Baton Rouge has the best frozen margaritas that I've ever had. It really does. <laughs> okay. okay, now, can you introduce yourself, please? I'm James Simpson, I'm a writer-producer. I've been involved in over 24 films, many of which were co-productions. I mean, only probably about two of them being... UK based, and, I'm London based. And when you say co productions, is the United States part of any of those co productions? Um, funnily enough, only on about one film. Most of them were either in Europe or Canada, um, mainly in Europe, um, Germany, Italy, Spain. So y your co productions really focus on the European market in co productions, and the uh, United States is not part of that equation? Um, in terms of co-production and some shooting, I mean, obviously, we haven't got any direct treaties. Um, uh, by intent. Yeah, by, by intent. Um, but obviously, the tax rates in America, uh, as you just said, Louisiana and all those other um, areas are, are big incentives. Um, I'm just about to start a, a film in Canada. And I mean, obviously, the Canadian, as we said, is a great tax benefit um, and slightly cheaper in some respects as well. But Europe... Um, Europe has been our main focus, um, just because of the content of the films, actually. I mean, that's the big issue, where, where it needed to be shot. So, in, in, in that culture, in your co-productions that you have done, and how you put them together, development, production, and post, how do you work to sort of minimize the various risks to the investors or the bank or whoever puts equity or debt into the picture? It's a, an interesting one. I think it's changed, I think, with all, all all of us will say on the panel, what's been amazing over the last four years is the rate of change of us throwing how uh, we put films together. And there used to be kind of golden rules, and those golden rules in general, I think, have gone. I think you're nearly inventing something every time you make a movie because of its different demands. I think on the lower-budget movies, um, it's just very interesting. I mean, this particular film I'm doing, we have funded it purely in equity, the whole budget's equity. And for the investors, it's very interesting that they are recouping um, all the tax credits without having to bank, which is great. It means they're not losing any of those tax credits. Uh, and we've invest, we've got um, tax relief through EIS. So our investors on this particular film are about 65% covered day one without even a pre-sale. Um, a very interesting about the private money, as you know, or know in, in the film's nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture. There were nine this year. Seven of them were wholly privately funded. And, and you're seeing private money going into the films in the United States. And as you said, we've got 41 states with... Louisiana being probably the most active Which is why state. Four of them were funded in Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and and but but I want to tell you, I have a knot in my stomach because Europe never ever wants to invite the United States to be part of a treaty in co-productions. And I can tell you that it's well, we're not invited to the parties. So what is your opinion about that? I think it's, it's quite historical. I mean, I think, you know, the debate on this, why were co-productions started in the first place? And I think some of that was to fight Hollywood. Um, which is not there anymore. Well, well which is, as you know, it's dissimilated uh, 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 okay. because of technology. Um, I don't know why there is still a um, need, but I think that possibly US as well, that, you know, they haven't gone out their way to, to invite co-production deals in terms of treaties and that. And I mean, you know, now China, India, who are the big two new players kind of about to take over a major chunk and, and once 
the, I mean, the world of justice. America is is it's 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 fragmented, and you've got federal and you've got state, and all the states are intensely competitive anyway. To put a co-production treaty together, and China's a great example, it takes a long time, and that's when it's just between China and the UK. It's, it's, they've been talking about it for six or seven years. It's really intense negotiations. It takes a long time to put it together. I'm not even sure how you'd do that in America. You know, look at Section 181 as a classic example. They missed by one vote about bringing it back, and actually. Filmmakers weren't using enough of it. But 181, 25% of your budget could have been spent in any of those Ab countries. Absolutely. But, but the federal government could engage with, with the, the government in the UK or wherever else. But what about the individual states? Because they want, they're competing with each other with their own state incentive, which isn't the case within France or, or, or within England or, or anything else. Absolutely. That it, so, so it's it's one government negotiating with another, but but you've then got a state level where it's intensely competitive, and also it's it's uh, by party. So, so some states going in one direction, some states not. So Louisiana has been incredibly successful with the tax credit, and all of the stages are, are, are fully booked. They do 150 films a year, 1.5 billion spent in the state each year on film, but. You know, Michigan's desperately trying to push up, Georgia's desperately trying to push up, and people are moving from Los Angeles to Louisiana because of the, the tax credit, because of the strength of the tax credit. They don't need more business, really, but the other states are, are pushing their credits in order to try and attract it. They want to keep all the spend locally. They actually don't want to, to push it out. In the independent film finance market, we need to combine, and we need to go to France and do yeah. finance only sometimes to, to pull France into a UK, Canada. You're going to see you know, UK, China as of a couple of weeks ago, and Australia already had one, so you have eventually UK, Australia, China. But that allows you to, to push up your soft money you know, into the 50s, the 60s, maybe even the 70s, which is extraordinary. Um, in, in America, actually, you can already have that. If, if you've grandfathered and you have 181 projects and, and you've got the tax credit, and the other thing is it's very pure because the tax credit in, in Louisiana is a good example or in Michigan where it's, it's 40 plus 2. Not anymore. Um, yeah, not anymore. But, but as examples of how they worked, it included the above the line. Right. Whereas in the co-pros, it's about normally where you consume it or, or you know, different uh, cultural points and, and whether it works. So for America, they'd, they're in a different place and it's very difficult for them to engage and they probably don't need to. Um, and anyway, we can do unofficial co-productions. So, for example... Well, if you can because you work in London. And ab absolutely. And but I could, for example, I can build... <laughs> on my stage at, at Plantation Village Studios in Louisiana, I can build a, a set, use all local labor, um, create everything, legitimately get the tax credit and all that expenditure. So I'll get 35 cents on the dollar. I can then send it across, you know, for, for the show in, in the UK. And, and they can then because it's where it's right, used, right, right. they can use it, and the charge for the use of that gets a tax credit. Uh, I, and you, you talked about 181 mm -hmm. that's not there. Uh, y you have 181 movies. Uh, how many do you have going into the future when there's no 181, and your projects uh, will always be 181? I think we're around about 40. Um, uh, all right. Uh, 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 which is amazing. Yeah, I mean, we took a leap of faith, and we started the production, and we correctly grandfathered them. We found a, a really good team, a very good lawyer, um, accountant, and, and a couple of guys that had done, done more than 35 themselves, so we were very safe. And the idea was we're, we're structuring financial deals that, that take an investor off risk from day one. It's 100% mitigated, um, and we got a huge, everyone's biting our hand off. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Hi, I'm Cyril Le Pesant, uh, the French guy, I believe. Uh, <laughs> I'm the CEO of um, <coughs> Nightworks, which is a company which will provide, which provide uh, services and production. On services, we work on VFX, animation, post-production, and line producing. And which we build the company uh, to, to grow with these services, to be able to work on production. So actually, we develop production by two TV series and a feature film. I will talk about that uh, if, you, if you want. And this is an, an animation movie. And as as you know, French market, even if we are quite uh, powerful, but it's a small market. So if you want to, to just make a quite good movie, you need to look to other markets. So you need to make a co-production with other countries. So we are looking for the States, but also Asia, because we, we are actually in our company, we speak... It's not, no, it's a small one, right. but even a small one, if you want to make something, and the, the, the fact is, we just, as we, we just make 
animation, we just know how it works and how you can use your money well. So we just decide it's a, it's a five million budget, so it's not so big for animation. But even five million, if you just want to be sure and to, to be able to finance the movie and to get back to to get the money back to every investors, you need to be sure that the market will be big enough. So of course it's better to go to the US, to Asia and other countries. And the other thing is in animation it's also easier to make some dubbing and other voices because you know you don't have the lip sync, right. it's not the same. So you can work for example on, on English lip sync and you make can make other voices. Right. And that's worked very well. So it's really easy for this kind of project to make really uh, to make a movie which is seems to be an American movie in the US and Chinese movie in China and Japanese movie in, in Japan and, and so on. So the idea is to work on that project and to be able to, to do it in, in front because as you know we got a lot of good animation people like on Despicable Me um, for Universal who was made in France. So we got a lot of, of talents actually in France. But usually those talents are going in the UK, in the US, or in Canada to work because they want to work on big projects. And actually, there's not a lot of, of big animation and big feature projects in France. I think because of the market, because French language, you know, people, a lot of people like this kind of French movie, but it's not so easy if you got a French language in other countries to just sell you, your, your animation movie. So the idea is really to be able to, to make a, a very good animation movie in France mostly in France and with other countries co-production and to keep this quality and just to, to keep the French talent in France and work on this kind of movie but to be able to make bigger one. And I think it's really possible because actually there's a lot of interesting which are just in, in production. As you know, uh, we, we have Despicable Me but we also had Asterix which is in currently in production. It's quite a big one and we can really make big ones but for that we'll, we need to have a bigger market. If we just work in the French market it's too small. Okay, thank so. you. Jill, um, uh, uh, being French yourself and setting up your distribution company in Park City, uh, Utah, where the Sundance Film Festival happens, T tell us about your company and you and how you view mitigating risk in the international market and co-productions. Well, so, <clears throat> so my company, Koan, is a, a distribution company originally. Uh, we have become production company in 2009 uh, through a number of uh, films that we've done since. Um, <clears throat> it's very interesting because my my story somehow is the reflection of what it used to be, which is that we were based in France and it was too complicated to work with uh, with the French people in a way, uh, the buyers. And I decided that being an American company would actually be better. And it was almost 20 years ago, and I was right. We, uh, we expanded, uh, this, uh, production companies in the US trusted us because I was French, but also we had a, an expertise in international distribution. And, and we did, uh, we succeeded. But the idea was that, uh, is, it, is that it's, uh, today you cannot just go by yourself and try to create your own production and hope that it's gonna sell. Uh, this, is, um, this, is, this is not a model that works anymore. There are too many people. <laughs> I know exactly. Before. It's uh, you really have to uh, to uh, do make partnership. You have to be smart on how to do it. It's very interesting what you said about you know every new project is a new model, pretty much. It's it's almost that. Uh, we have right now several productions that we're uh, we have in development and that and that we are considering one with Asia, uh, another one with uh, Spain right now, uh, maybe shooting in the in the. Uh, in the uh, some islands there are there I forgot actually <laughs> which ones, but uh, but there are a lot of programs that have that have uh, you know help and try to incentive people and make them come to to their country. So that's that's the way it has to be. And what we see today even more at this kind of film festival, we felt already at MIP TV is is the fact that you can come now with uh, with some um, some uh, teaser or trailer about film, and people are so much more now uh, careful. Buyers are so much more. They actually want to see the film finished now. 
There's a lot of things I have to do with. We trust what you do. We know you're a good production company. You deliver. It's quality. But today, we cannot afford anymore to make the, take the risk and say, oh, okay, I'm coming and I'm going to buy your film, although I haven't seen it finished. I need to see it finished. I need to know for sure that there is a market before I spend the money. And the problem with that is if you have not anticipated that as a producer already, you might find out you're having you know, a, a film and you go to the trade shows and it doesn't sell. So you have now more and more to actually go before you actually make the film to make sure that all the elements are there, that, that you either have partners on board or you have buyers committed to buy it eventually when it's done. But today, nobody wants to make that risk because the, 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 the market moves so much. It's a, it's a moving target all the time. You're trying to aim and it moves every, in every direction to be a slightly more you know, heavy yeah. images of animation somehow. This is, uh, this is what it is. It's very, very difficult. And I think actually picking up on two things there that are really important. Um, one, I think there is a model and, and you should try and replicate it over and over. I don't think you should be trying to reinvent it each time. But I absolutely agree that part of that model is you need to involve sales and distribution as early as possible. And you must be making it for the market. You need to get the market feedback before you start to even know what you can afford to pay for this film, let alone how you're going to finance it. People are too much of in a rush to, to get the film into production so they have some money in their pocket and, and they can say they have their film and then they hope that the marketing works. And how many producers come to you and then they don't even deliver? They give you something, then you've got to deliver it. You know, the thing's a mess and they've gone and they're on to the next project. Well, this is crazy to me. And, and actually, the, the correct way I feel to, to properly mitigate investors' risk is to give them the best uh, soft money incentives you can and then add in all the other pieces. But while you're putting that together, you should already have found out at the very first port of call which kind of cast you can afford for the budget you're making the film and your budget should be determined by the market value. So you need to find the good top tier sellers, talk to them and talk to distributors and, and get that market intel that's current, that's real then you form your budget based on that. And we actually had this on, on a couple of films where we were overfinanced, but we couldn't get the leads that we wanted. So in fact, they probably won't go. The films won't go because the market's saying, no, we think it's great. Well, <laughs> the market's saying no. To give you an example, Jake, uh, about how it works, and we have talked about this before, the current movie that I'm on, I uh, used all those pieces. Yeah. It's a $15 million project. It's a Miles Davis Great stars. We've got 8.5 million in pre-sale before we even started. We've got the 181, uh, 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 181, and we're filming in uh, New York, which with a st uh, approved studio is a 35 percent on what you spend. And what happens in in that particular situation? Because we have looked at that, uh, the investors are in a $1 million profit before we even finish the movie. And, and we had the same thing on, on the film we just finished, Breaking the Bank with, with Kelsey Grammer, because we could push so much into it. And this is what, what I was talking about, not trying to reinvent it each time. We say, well, okay, in any of these jurisdictions, we've set up in Canada, we're in Louisiana, we're in the UK, we have the infrastructure there, and we push all the infrastructure behind it. So every single suit they were wearing, every single tuxedo, well, Kelsey just wore his to the Expendables Premier, he loved it that much. But that was a product placement from my product placement company. We, we do product placement, and that's cash and in kind. So every time, all the hero cars, instead of spending a thousand pound a day on them, they were paying us to be involved. I think um, that's partly what we're saying about reinventing the mm. wheel. That I think you're absolutely right. You need a model, like any other business. Yeah, but what don't, rein, don't reinvent the model. Keep a new soup into make the, the model right. Without. Look after your people and, and and come back because you've made your investors money and you've got the good uh, incentives that you know and you know how to work with. The banks will bank them and they'll bank them for you. You've got sellers around you that you want to work with and you have meaningful relationships with them. And they, again, they enjoy it because you don't just dump it on them and you follow it through. But you also should have all these relationships with brands and product placement that you can then always click back in. Yeah. Um, but the producer now has to think much more out of the box. I mean, 10 years ago, the producer wouldn't necessarily have had to do that. Um, but they're having to think of other ways of bringing in finance. Again, I think, product I, think, placement I think producers were just, were just uh, quite lazy, lazy and it was yeah, too absolutely. easy. Sell and lease back and uh, EIS or, made it or, easy. Or because 10 years ago, you still had producers thinking they can go to studios and thinking they had money and they were going to fund their pictures. Mm. That, that, that's gone. Uh, Jill, um, in this world that you're doing and the pieces of the puzzle and there's no as far as I'm concerned there's no model that you, you repeat every element in from time to time when you look at a project how do you try to fit those pieces in uh, internationally 
of the, the equity? Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer that just, you know, the way you hope for it, maybe, or... But it's just that it's a, it's a, it's a very complex... It's a complex thing. We were, I mean, like, just before I came, that's why I'm late. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, was, I was actually at a <laughs> that meeting. That comes first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. I was at that meeting, you know, where we were discussing the advantages of actually shooting in, in, uh, in Spain. And everybody was trying to find, you know, was trying to look at what they would bring, what they would get out of it, you know, in terms of tax incentives, the difficulty of shooting in a place where you have never done, never shot there. You don't know how the crews are going to be. Uh, sometimes you have tax incentives that are very high, but in, rea in fact, you realize that, you know, the crews that are there, you might have some issues with it. They may not, you know, ch they may change. I'm not going to say anything about some any state over here, but, but some are known to change the deals when it's done. Uh, or I, I mean, crews that are, you know, that are going to be more expensive overall. So it's, this is a, this is something you, a lot of, a lot of time, you know, I, I was remember at that very specific meeting, people saying, okay, the guy being very elusive about what it is, you know, percentage and so on. And I said, you know what, just put that on paper. Let's write on it. This is the budget, it's $10 million. Who gets what, who brings what, what do we get with the tax incentive in order to actually visually be able to say, okay, now, now we understand now who plays what and how we get the money from our investors because it's a, it's, it's, there's a complexity in doing that. I, I, I'm told now that, that we have five minutes to go, but I want to ask you, um, in your animation, uh, I mean projects, um, you obviously have to do something, as you said, that will, will go out outside of France. So in your thought process, as you develop your projects, how do you think about your projects as it's going to relate to how it's going to affect and go out internationally into the market? You mean in terms of story? Yeah. Uh, the thing is, it's, it's easier with animation because we are, it's, a, it's a sort of magic world with pirates and sorcerers, so it's easier to make it universal. So, but the thing is, of course, we need to, to think about uh, other culture, if it's going to work in other countries or not. And of course, the jokes are not the same. Right. For example, so comedy doesn't sell. Yeah, yeah. For example, if, if I'll take the 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 Asterix, but the, the the live action one, the thing is, it was working very well in France, but people didn't get the joke in other countries, so it doesn't work. So, we need to be clever clever about that and and to think about the the dialogues and how we're gonna how gonna be the story, of course, but how gonna be the jokes and the little little things that you, you are working on and, and the, the, the dialogues need to be very, you need to work more on that, of course. But the thing is, the, the global story is quite universal with, with this kind of, of magic worlds. So it's, it's sort of a little bit easier, but it's a really big issue. I, I completely agree. I, I want to just conclude by, by, by thanking all of you. I'm a uh, principal in a law firm of Deutsch, Levy and Engel, and I lead up the entertainment division in, in the firm. Uh, what I want you all to know is that we look to all of you to help us restructure how we look at things to bring the entire world into the equation of how we make, market, and show films. That's animation and features. So I, I, thank, all, I thank all of you for coming. Thanks, for coming. And I thank Black thank Hanger Productions and uh, Plantation v uh, Village Studios for uh, hosting this. No problem. Okay.